Thank you very much for coming to this session. We have about 300, 300 more seats, so keep coming in. How do you like my introduction slide? Nice. I spent about 35 seconds on it, so. Um, I work for Microsoft in, here in Sweden. Um, I've been doing that for the last 14 years. Uh, during the last five or four and a half years, I've been working with the area of analytics or BI or whatever we chose to call it this year, I usually say. Um, I honestly don't know my real title. It, when I go in and it shows up in different kinds of, but this is essentially what I do. I'm a technical specialist within analytics. So, if data is the new oil, you will need a platform. Does anybody know what this is? Anyone recognize it? This is Troll A, the largest movable object ever created by man. Uh, built for Statoil in 1995, it's 472 meters high. Are there any oil platform aficionados out there? No? Because that person would have told me, that's not an oil platform, it's a gas platform, but yeah, doesn't make sense. It's a nice platform and the biggest object. You will need a place to store it. The raw sludge, the raw oil, needs to be stored somewhere. The raw sludge data also needs to be stored somewhere. This is a Swedish oil reserve somewhere in Sweden. Some people say it's in Gothenburg, some people say it's in Stockholm, I don't know. But I do know it's been emptied now, unfortunately. Do You see the guy in the little dinghy there? Ah, I encircled him in black. That's it uh, doesn't really make sense. That's a data scientist, right? Trying to figure out some interesting stuff about the raw data he's, he's, uh, he's looking at. The raw data in itself isn't that interesting maybe for a few people, uh, data scientists. And when they've found it and when they've started to look at it, they need tools to refine it. In a refinery, you've got these nozzles and these, all these different kinds of tools and pumps and pipes in order to, to get and refine the raw product into something that's interesting, right? You need ways to distribute. When the data has been refined and you want to push it to analysts and analysts want to look at it, they need to know when they pull up to the gas station that the, their finely tuned business decision engine they have gets the right fuel, right? And of course, in the end, you need dashboards to make the right decisions. So all these things, of course, fit into what you could call some kind of data pipeline. And um, I, of course, interpret these as data centers and large amounts of, oh, sorry, places where you can store things, tools for refinement, the refinery in itself, uh, ways to distribute and visualize. It's a pipeline. And I could go in and talk about visualization because that's what I usually do, but today I'm not. I'm going to focus on these two because this conference is about innovation. And it's specifically in the refinery where innovation today can happen. So let's start there. In the refinery, I said you will find the, the men and women in white robes uh, uh, doing, looking at the raw data and doing all these different kinds of things with it, right? From a data standpoint, Let's move, all, let's move away, away from the oil business for a while, right? We talk about business processes. These are the main and the low-hanging fruit, essentially, and what we've historically been doing with, with the traditional wordings like data mining and those kinds of things. Basically, it's the same thing today, 
algorithms that has become way smarter. Um, but anyway, it's the same thing essentially that we've been doing for quite some time. What we can do, of course, with the business processes is create the new kind of, of, uh, uh, of intelligence. Think about the controller who wants another a controller, maybe a salesperson, that want a, a new column in his report saying customer churn prediction, right? Those are the, the classical kind of business process that can be, if, uh, effect, uh, uh, can be made way more smarter using uh, algorithms like that. Um, one example here um, is Rolls-Royce, where we've had a, uh, a pretty interesting partnership now for three years, where we have uh, helped them draw conclusions from their engines. Rolls-Royce is in the business of airplane moving, essentially. They sell, serve, they sell airplane movement today to their customers, the airlines. They have about 14,000, 15,000 engines up and running simultaneously. 24-7. Uh, and of course, these engines, they have life cycles, and they need to be serviced and managed and washed and whatnot. So uh, extracting all the sensor data from these engines and pairing that with the very, very good historical records that we have with, it, with, uh, with servicing, um, we've created uh, machine learning models essentially predicting when different kinds of, of parts, when they will fail, when they will need servicing, etc. The impact that has, this has given, of course, is uh, for Rolls-Royce to have a way, way better way of, of predicting and planning service windows and all those kinds of things, and saving literally millions of dollars every day for Rolls-Royce, which is pretty interesting. Today, when a, uh, when a plane with Rolls-Royce engines lands, all the data is being pulled, and this is no, uh, this is doesn't isn't done with 4G networks or streaming data or something like that. It's pretty basic. They actually use thumb drives to extract all the data, and then they put them into uh, a system where that is then pulled in. Also, what they're what they're experiment, experimenting now with is digital twins. So every engine will have a digital twin. Uh, that they can uh, test out things with, because they've now got so much data about these engines historically, and also very, very real time or near real time after every cycle, af after every flight, that they can have this digital twin. If you want to know more about this, come to our booth, uh, because we actually have one of the guys who was in this case and building it um, in the booth. Uh, he's actually giving a, s a speak in another room right now. Another one is ourselves, and I think this is pretty interesting. We have um, expressed, uh, our kind of uh, leaders have expressed, yeah, we, we want to we use AI, we want to know better, we have better forecasts. As a public company, um, the forecasts we do, um, of course, affects uh, a lot of, of stock, stockholders, right? So this is very, very important for us. Um, what we've done is look at the data we have in our pipelines, in our CRM systems, and um, started to uh, predict things on them. And uh, uh, six months ago, uh, we had another column show up on our controllers, and this is true for our, our guys here in Stockholm, the controllers we have here. Uh, a new column for them show up saying machine learned forecast. And um, they started to look at it, and the forecast, forecasting that these controllers did was one of their main tasks. And I've, um, I've actually I talked to them uh, the other week, can I say this? Can I say what, what, what's about to happen? And they said, yes, you can. Uh, in about one week's time, in April, we will move to a completely uh, machine learning forecast model. Because during the six months' time that they tried this out, the machine learning forecast was way better than their own. So it's really, really transforming uh, the way the business, uh, sorry, the, the, um, uh, the controller can work with the business so they can move into way more uh, productive work than just trying to figure out the most, uh, uh, yeah, the, the, the best forecast. Pretty um, intriguing, actually. So business processes is, is one thing, of course, my clicker stopped working. 
uh, is one thing uh, that, of course, happens in the refinery. And as I said, maybe the most logical one. Other things that we see happening are intelligent applications. Uh, Uber, for instance, they have a, a sign-in verification of the driver uh, in their mobile app for the driver. That's driven by, by a, a, um, uh, a facial recognition engine, right? Um, we actually build uh, applications. Let's just switch here. We, of course, also build applications where we utilize machine learning algorithms um, also. We infuse them, essentially. So, for instance, here in this little report, I can right-click and say Analyze and explain the decrease. Why was there a decrease from Q4 in 2011 to 2012? And um, up pops this little dialog. So, what the dialog shows it goes in and looks at all the underlying dimensions. It's actually a pretty straightforward um, um, algorithm, right? Just looks at the different kinds of, of, uh, of dimensions and categories, and then stack ranks them with the categories that had most effect of this percentage. So, what can we read from this? Road 150 accounted for model name, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, there is something thing with, with different kind of models. You scroll down here. This is the one I think was fun. So um, it turns out that red bicycles sell way, way less in Q, uh, Q1 than in Q4. Makes sense, right? Christmas, everybody wants a red bike. So that was the joke. Sorry for that. So um, yes. Ah, it died on me. Well, intelligent apps. Um, these are things that, of course, you also can build. I will um, have a demo of how you can essentially utilize algorithms today, um, literally in, in apps, uh, in any kind of apps you want to. Um, your own algorithms or algorithms that are, are baked into APIs that are ready to consume directly. And I think it's in 14 at uh, half past two or something. The last one, the last trend that is, uh, has been going on for a couple of years are digital agents. We used to call them bots. I, I think we, they were usually actually still call them bots, but digital agents of some form. Um, we estimate that in, nine, uh, in, uh, in seven years, in 2025, 95% of all customer interactions will be driven by bots. 95%. Um, here I met with a customer uh, yesterday, this is actually true, met with a customer yesterday that builds, uh, that are building a bot for their employees. They have thousands of employees. I'm not allowed to tell you what customer this is, unfortunately. Um, but they have um, thousands of employees, and they're surfacing a bot to their users instead. So, so for, sorry, to their employees, not the consumers or their end customers their own employees. And this is, from a bot perspective, is the low-hanging fruit. Creating uh, a interaction, a quick interaction, in order to figure out daily administrative tasks that you have in your work, in the operations, but also, of course, HR-like questions and those kinds of things. And one of the guys actually said something very interesting in the, uh, in the meeting. He said, you know, we, um, and they had, let me tell you, they had integrated about eight different kind of knowledge bases, uh, uh, Q&A's um, kind of uh, knowledge bases, where people can get questions and, uh, and um, sorry, ask a question and get an answer back from, from already made um, knowledge bases. They've also integrated, I think it was four or five different kinds of, of checklists and those kinds of things that they have in their daily work that they need to do. Um, uh, a lot of the work that they have to do adheres to uh, looking at documentation and making sure they follow a, a certain kind of, of rules that are, are specified from outside of the company. So that's also something that they're surfacing. Uh, so they've built, I think it's about uh, six intentions into this bot, and they've had great success with it uh, initially. They're t testing it out right now, so it's not ready yet. Um, and at the end of the meeting, I, s I was going to tell you, he said, well, we don't really see a need for an intranet anymore uh, if this goes as planned. Nobody goes to the internet anyway, uh, he said. So we actually see the bot being way more productive in this, in this manner. And 
uh, way more simple to, to fill with, uh, with new intelligence or sorry, new data. Stepping back from the refinery uh, and going back to the gas station, essentially, the distribution, from a completely different standpoint, um, distributing data is one thing, distributing visualizations is another, distributing intelligence or distributing art, uh, the intelligence and uh, an algorithm or a machine learning algorithm or a deep neural network algorithm can give you is also something that's interesting. And this is where we talk about hybrid deployments or edge cases, essentially. Edge case, that's that bad wording, sorry. <laughs> When you have a, uh, a machine producing something and you have sensors spitting out thousands of, uh, of uh, pieces of information every second, the cloud will not be able to cope with that because of speed of light. So the ability to train a model in the cloud on huge amounts of data um, is very valuable, but then bring that comp that kind of uh, that model, be it done with Python or R or what have you, down to the very machine itself is pretty important. Specifically, when it comes to um, to uh, um, streaming data, that comes in uh, a lot of um, uh, a lot of of, um, of these cases, uh, predictive maintenance, for instance. Uh, but also um, other kinds of scenarios that we see are, are emerging now. Video using CCTV cameras, video surveillance, and actually analyzing them in real time to find equipment and to find people and understand how many people are in a specific area in a room. Um, in hospitals, for instance, this is a real case where we're, uh, where we're building using the existing CCTV cameras uh, a system where you can actually see or f or just ask for a wheelchair and the system will tell you that there is one in this corridor because it's been seen on the CCTV camera using existing environment, uh, sorry, the video equipment. That's pretty interesting. In those kinds of cases when you need very, very quick uh, response times from algorithms, being able to bring it down to is important to the place itself. The other part, complete different aspect, uh, where, which I think is interesting is in, in, uh, in the area of data embedding. Sharing uh, data with business uh, partners or customers has become a way more um, uh, often asked from, from my customers, uh, specifically uh, in areas where, where we have a, a, some kind of service that's provided, right? Um, so I just wanted to uh, demo that quickly. Uh, just to make sure you understand how simple these things are to do today. And uh, what is a demo from Microsoft if you don't have Visual Studio, right? So, of course, I want to show Visual Studio. No. Um, but I wanted to uh, just make sure you understand what you can do with these kinds of semantic models that uh, we call them. This is essentially the gas station that I've built a model. And in here, you can see this is traditional adventure works. Um, people can connect to this model using any kind of um, tool. They can use Tableau, they can use Click, they can use Excel, they can even use Power BI if they want to. And the model itself, of course, consists of columns and tables and whatnot. It's an in-memory model that I've already kind of um, done. But the demo I wanted to do is pretty uneventful graphically and, and so, but for me it's profound. Um, this server is actually hosted in the cloud. It's hosted in the cloud not as a virtual machine, it's a pass service. No virtual machines are, are being harmed during this demo. None, okay? So in here you see I've specified a role for reader and the pe per person here is Frederick L. That's a colleague of mine. He can access this using his email address. That's the thing I, I do in order for him to get to the, to the tables he needs to see. But this button is kind of interesting. It says add external. And that means I can add a person that's in another domain. So let's try this out. So I haven't tried this before. So this will be a, a interesting thing to see if that works. It did work beautifully. So this means that this data, data source, this data model, including all those different tables and everything, can now be shared with a person that's outside my domain. 
the question comes up, of course, how does that person log on? Well, using their own credentials, of course. I don't even have to manage them. They can log on using their own credentials because this service, this data service that runs in the cloud, Azure Analysis Services, utilizes a federated identity store, right? It's even, it's even better. I can actually enter a, a security group in there if I want to and have the other organization manage the access themselves. So, with that, I wanted to close and say when it comes to... Um, I wanted to close with this image and say that uh, when it comes to, um, to the new brave world of, of cloud uh, platforms, choose wisely. Thank you very much. Thank you.